Good day, New Life family and friends. So happy you could join us again today. As always, we know you can choose to worship online somewhere else, in person somewhere else, but we're thankful that you come to us and um, hopefully we have something for you today. Our music isn't perfect. Our messages aren't perfect. Even our keeping up with people are not perfect, but we are family and we're willing to welcome anyone into our family. And if you need anything, please just ask. Thank you.
What if we pulled some children and we asked them what they wanted for their meals for the day and they got to be in charge and we pulled everyone, what do you think they'd come up with? I bet you I got a pretty good idea of what it could be. Say the child wants candy for breakfast, maybe ice cream for lunch, and maybe s'mores for dinner, that sounds good. And they think that that will make them happy and make them feel good. But you and I know that any child who would actually get that wish would end up feeling worse than they did before they had all that for their meals. It just wouldn't work, would it? Aren't we all just really children, me included? Think about me. If I could do whatever I wanted, maybe I would have Mountain Dew and donuts for breakfast. Maybe I'd have pizza for lunch because I really like pizza. And then I'm not sure if I'd have wings or like a cheeseburger for dinner, but I know that whatever I didn't have, I'd have that for a snack right before I went to bed. So aren't we all just really children? Do you think that would work for me? Do you think God wants you to be happy? Sure, I do. I think he wants us to be happy. But does God think that us getting that new job that we want, that house, that car, um, a good grade on your test, the winning basket in the game, scoring the winning goal, um, the clothes that you want, uh, anything, does he think all of that will give you true happiness? I would say probably not. So there's a disconnect here. You see, God knows best. Now, knowing that God knows best, how do we make good decisions? And as we come into our last week here, in our Don't Panic series, Big Decisions in the Bible, we're gonna look at Mary. Uh, there's not a lot written in the Bible about Mary, but it's very important. And we're gonna be reading in the book of Luke, Chapter 1, and we're going to do a couple different sections here, but we're going to start with Luke chapter 1, and we're going to read 26 through 38. Um, a beautiful story. Beautiful, beautiful story. So big decisions in the Bible. This week it's Mary, starting in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. <coughs> Has anyone ever read that little story there and saw Mary? saw the angel Gabriel and all these things and, and wondered a few of the things that I've wondered. And as I read further in the chapter and I'm waiting for my question to be answered, I haven't seen it. <clears throat> Being a dad, here's my first question. Where was the dad? Where was Mary's dad? Where is she? She's got these big decisions to make, these big things going on, and her dad isn't anywhere near. Um, was, since Mary was already engaged to be married, was he just kind of left the picture? because <clears throat> she's taken care of and she's gone. Uh, did he not care about daughters? Did they only care about sons? I don't know, that's kind of possible. Um, we don't know. We don't know where the dad is. I know one thing, if that was me and that happened to my daughter, I would be in this story. You'd see me and I'd interject myself. But back in this time when this story was written, all we know says nothing about Mary's father. He's nowhere to be seen. So in other words, Mary had to make these big decisions on her own. She was all alone. She had friends and she had a few other, and she had her uh, person, Joseph, who she was engaged to, to be married. But she had to make these decisions all alone. 
<clears throat> we're just gonna quickly go through some of the observations from the story. And the first part is from that per, uh, first part we read here, when the uh, angel Gabriel came to Mary. And the thing I learned from Mary from reading this was ask for direction, not escape. What do I mean by that? See, it says Mary was perplexed and she was pondering, but she wasn't flipping out. She is in amazement, certainly, because there's this angel, there's this, this thing, this glowing person. But there is a calm dignity and purity in her reply. She asks how this can happen since she is a virgin. This was not the question of a doubter, not someone who was snarky or sarcastic, but of a believer. See, she wanted direction. Was she to go on with her proposed marriage with Joseph? Or was she to break up with him? Or was she to do something else? She didn't know, so she's asking a question. She didn't brag. She didn't say, God picked me. I am great, and we got this. I'm so ready for this. And she also didn't try to escape and say, oh, this is too big for me. I'm just going to go the other way. No, thank you, God. She didn't even ask for another sign or a reassurance for God or, or test him in any way. She basically said, what next? You see, instead of all the things she could do, she asked for direction. She didn't try to escape. So that's advice for us. Ask for direction, not escape. We read a little bit more. Luke 1 starting in verse 39, says Mary visits Elizabeth. Now at this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And now has it happened to me, that the mother of my Lord would come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed there, there would be a fulfillment of what had been so spoken to her by the Lord. Now, in a lot of translations, in a lot of stories, it says that Elizabeth called Mary blessed and highly favored. There's this idea of being blessed and that this because she's carrying this unborn child that Mary is blessed and highly favored. But I gotta ask you this question. See here, two, the, the other advice we can get from this is seek God's favor, not man's. Got that? Seek God's favor, not the favor of man. Or seek God's blessings, not the blessings of man. See, Mary accepts this situation with all its risks. And now Elizabeth calls her blessed and highly favored. By what standards is she blessed and highly favored? Certainly not the world's. Can you think of that? There was a teenage pregnancy while not married. There was a long and tiring journey to a small town to have the baby. There was no room at the inn. The birth was done in a stable and the baby had nowhere to be cradled but in the straw of the oxen's crib. Then she had to return to Nazareth, the long years of obscurity and poverty there in the village hidden among its hills. Her child must go out into a life which she soon perceived would be one of increasing danger. Lowly people loved her son Jesus, but powerful people hated him. Taken by priests and rulers of his own nation and accused before the Roman governor, led to a hilltop amidst a jeering crowd, and there hung upon a cross. Does that sound like favor with God? See, the world thinks that God's favor is in ease and pleasure and prosperity. People think themselves fortunate because they have never been called upon to face great difficulties and man with nothing to show but weakness in their lives. You see, it is the lives which has been given something great to do, something important, and to bear, even though they may have been bruised in the process from whatever they've been asked to bear. Those people have truly known the favor of God. You see, God is the source of Mary's joy. She's seeking God's favor, not man's favor. She let her reputation lie in the hands of God and not of man. That's what we can learn from our decisions. When we're deciding what to do and when we're not sure, 
We can seek the favor of God, seek the blessings of God, and not of man. And as we read a little bit farther, there's a great poem here, a song. It's Luke 1, starting at verse 46. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit is rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. This little thing here that we read, we're going to talk about a little more. But this is what I see when I read this. After she's visited by the angel Gabriel, after she goes and visits Elizabeth, then this is how she responds. You see, Mary chose to have a good attitude. And so three, that's what we're to do. Choose to have a good attitude. See, sometimes your decision may be to do this. Sometimes it may be to do that. Sometimes it may be to wait. But sometimes... Your only decision to make is to have a good attitude about whatever happens. See, there were no immediate demands on Mary. She only had to consent to the divine offer. She only had to say yes. So she submitted herself of her own free will to what she felt was the will of her God. And you know what she did after that and after she told her friend? She sang a song. She made up a song on the spot. And it's very important in the Catholic Church and other churches, a lot of people call it the Magnificat. It's the hymn of Mary, and people still sing it today. You see, this beautiful song is actually a prayer, but it's the highest kind of prayer, for it asks for nothing. It simply breathes adoration and thankfulness. And when I see this song, and I think how she has responded and everything she's done, this is what I think in my head. I can only imagine her repeating that song that she made up over and over and over again. First, she sang it to Elizabeth. Then she sang it while on her long journey to Bethlehem. And then maybe she sang it to her newborn baby as they were in the ox's trough. And over and over again, she sang this song. This is what I envisioned. Then when things got harder, her song of joy, she sang it over and over again. When her son was on the cross, she could have sang it over and over again. See, you choose to have a good attitude. You choose to feed your soul rather than your appetites. Did you hear that? You choose to feed your soul rather than your appetite. That is what's good for us. I close today with this question, why Mary? Why Mary, this one person? We don't know anything about any of the stories in the Bible, why God chooses who he chooses, but why Mary? See, the Son of God was to be conceived by a human mother, a virgin. And that was said in Isaiah 7, 14. This was a prophecy. She's fulfilling prophecy by a virgin Mother, a human mother. See, that very thought alone, it was to challenge the selfish powers of that time, of the earth, and to lift up those of a low degree. Think about it. The next king, the king of the world, was not coming from a well-groomed child that went to private school. It wasn't from a rich family. It wasn't from anything like that that you'd see in a movie. Where's the king going to come from? Well, they brought this person up from birth, to be kingly and to learn how to eat and to learn how to deal with people and to learn how to go to battle. No, it wasn't that. It wasn't to come from a well-groomed child. For the mother of Jesus, God did choose the maid of Nazareth in her meek obedience and then the lovely purity of her virgin soul. That's why God chose Mary. And that's why when we help and we do the decisions 
that we talk about and we make the right ones and we choose God and we choose to feed our soul than rather than our appetite. Um, we may look lowly to the world. We may look silly when we make our decisions that way. But that's how we make good decisions. We make them for God because God knows best. Thank you.